Hello, Hope Church family, and welcome again to Hope Church Online. We are so glad that you are joining us again, and I hope that you are loving this series on discipleship as much as I am. It's been awesome to get feedback from so many people talking about how it's such an integral part of the Bible, and yet we can spend so little time talking about it or practicing it in our everyday lives. So we're calling this series Becoming Disciples because it's about following Jesus and allowing Him through the Holy Spirit to guide us as we invite other people along with us. It's what we see Jesus doing going back to Matthew 4 and the reason that we are doing this whole series is He just invited people, the least likely, the people who had done nothing to deserve it in a worldly sense. But Jesus invites them along with Him. So again, every week we're going to be talking and, and looking at different tools to put in our tool belt of discipleship. And I'm really excited about some of the other plans that we are making as we move forward in this. Now today, I'm really excited to have Cam Stewart preaching with us. And Cam has preached several times for us. Cam is the head of our stewardship team here at Hope Church. And he just has uh, such a servant's heart. Both him and his wife, Sarah, have such a servant's heart in how they lead and how they um, serve in so many different capacities here at Hope Church. So I'm very excited to have him coming and sharing with us this evening, talking about grace-filled discipleship. So would you join me in prayer, and then we'll go right to his word. Lord, I thank you so much that we can come together and worship you, that we can come together and serve you. Lord, I pray that as we go through this series, not just tonight, but through this entire series, as we look at your word, that you would, through the Holy Spirit, convict us in our lives of the areas that we need to change. Lord, as we examine this, this area of discipleship, something that is so prevalent in your word, something that is so prevalent that you have commanded us to do, something that was the basis of the early church and so many other churches around the world. Lord, I pray that you would guide us in how we can be discipling those around us as we disciple each other. Lord, I pray that you be with Cam, that it would be your spirit guiding him, that it would be your word, that it would be you that he is showing to us this evening as we come to your word to see the things that we can change through the power that you have. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope Church, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you this evening. So excited to uh, continue our series on discipleship tonight. And so um, we're going to talk tonight about discipleship, what it is, what it isn't, and how the grace of God is all throughout it. That is not a checklist. That is not something that we have to achieve or understand or know. Um, that it is all about grace that God's grace runs through the idea of discipleship. So I'm going to pray, and then we are going to dive right in. Jesus, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for this church. Thank you that we get to come together as a fellowship of believers and as a family to sing and to be together, to share life and to hear from your word. God, I pray that your word would speak to us about what discipleship is, what it is not, God, I pray that everyone would leave here encouraged and with something that they can do, tangibly that they can do in the realm of discipleship. Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us tonight and that you would move hearts to change as only you can do. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Um, so as I was thinking about discipleship this week, two stories came to mind that were kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum of uh, times that I have experienced discipleship in my life. And the first one is when uh, I came on Young Life staff around 2012, maybe 13. Um, and I got to know a, a high school friend named Kyle. And uh, his parents actually let me live in their basement because I didn't have a place to live. And uh, we just got to do life together. He was, a, he was starting to figure out what it meant to actually live out his faith. And so we got to talk about that. We got to meet. We got to read the Bible together. We got to pray together. We got to reach out to his friends. We got to see some of those friends come to know Jesus. We got to then bring those friends into the same thing that we were doing. It was just it, the, the quintessential picture of what discipleship is. The second example that came to mind is um, the Jacksons. And uh, some of you heard me last week uh, cry a lot talking about them. They're a very close family to us and they just moved to Hawaii. Um, but the Jacksons, when we moved into our street, um, 
we should have been reaching out to our neighbors. We should have been praying for our neighbors, and we were not. And the Jacksons started a relationship with us. And then uh, after the relationship was started, I should have been inviting to them. I should have asked them to come to church. I did not. Mandy brought that up. Mandy said, hey, tell me about your church. And even after that, after they decided to come to church, I should have been asking follow-up questions. Hey, what did you think of the sermon? How did, the, how did this hit you? What were your takeaways? I didn't. And even in the midst of all of that, God decided to grab their hearts and change their lives. And they got baptized here and got involved here at Hope Church. Their lives were changed forever. And uh, those two stories on opposite ends of the spectrum and a thousand other stories that I could give you and other people could give you that are failed attempts at discipleship, that's what we're talking about tonight. All of those things is discipleship. My, one of my old bosses, uh, Rob, stole this quote a couple weeks ago, but that's okay. One of my old bosses used to say that discipleship is friendship with a vision. It's not this some, some intellectual assent that you have to know the right things or you have to do the right checklist or you have to stop doing this and start doing this. That is just simply friendship with a vision, regardless of the response, regardless of the results. And God's grace is over all of it. Whether it looks like what we believe discipleship is or whether it looks nothing like it and you had nothing to do and God just lavishes his grace and decides to have people come to know him, that it is all about grace. Discipleship is messy, it's not perfect, and it simply is growth in Jesus through the Holy Spirit. There is grace in the midst of discipleship. And, and things we need to know about discipleship that are gospel truths, these are true of us always of the gospel, but, but I think in the church we lose sight of these gospel truths in the, in the context of discipleship. Number one, you and I, we are not good. We were never good. If you think that you have arrived at some level of righteousness, you have not. I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> I have not either. Uh, if you do think that you have, uh, just by show of hands, who would feel comfortable if we were able to put all of your words, thoughts, and actions from the last week on the screens for everyone to watch? I would imagine no one would feel comfortable with that. That we are not good, but God is. That he has lavished his grace upon us. So that's number we're not good. The second one, that is not about us. When we talk about the gospel, it's nothing that we have done. We talk about here that it, when you come to know Jesus, it's making him the forgiver of your sins and the leader of your life. That's nothing on us. That God decides to forgive our sins because of his great love for us. And then that he leads us out of his grace and out of his Holy Spirit. That is not about you. And the third part about discipleship is that you can do this. That I know that sounds a little contradictory to that you're not good. It's not about you. But you can do this through God's grace, through his Holy Spirit. A couple things that discipleship is not. It is not a one-hour meeting that gets Instagrammed at Starbucks. It is not a checklist of, of deep theological questions that you have to be able to answer. It is not uh, eliminating the visible sins in your life. It's not reducing your sin and your, and your bad thoughts to a level that is acceptable to you or that is comparable to someone that where you could say, hey man, I'm a little bit better than them. None of that is discipleship. It's simply following Jesus. So we're going to take a look. We're going to kind of be all over Scripture tonight, but the first passage we're going to look at is uh, in Matthew chapter 4. We've read this a couple weeks ago. Um, it says Jesus calls his first disciple. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, join me in reading. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat, and their father followed him. The come and follow me in that passage has so much grace in it that the God of the heavens, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, Alpha and Omega, came to earth and decided to get in, into the muck, excuse me, and do life with a bunch of messed up fishermen and say, come and follow me. Come and be a part of my life. 
the amount of grace in there is incredible. And then as Christians, when we come to Jesus, all we talk about is that it's all about grace, that we are sinful, that God has lavished his life, that they have lavished his love upon us, and that it is all about grace. And then after that, somehow, we turn discipleship and growth and our time with Jesus into a checklist, and we throw the grace out. out. That is not the case in discipleship, that all of it is about grace. Our relationship with Jesus is based solely on grace. Our relationship with others as we disciple others and do life with others is all about grace. That God's grace is not conditional. That it is unconditional love and unconditional grace. So that's our personal relationship with Jesus. That that is the invitation for you and for me. Come and follow him. Come and follow him and grow in the knowledge and the goodness of God. And then we move on to discipleship as we call others along with us. That phrase that Jesus says, come and follow me, implies that he is going somewhere. You would not say, come and follow me to someone and that he would just sit there and not do anything, right? That, that Jesus was on his way, that he had a vision for his life and he was calling people into that vision. That the same goes for you and I as we disciple other people. Are you living a life that is worthy of someone following you? Let's say that again. Are you living a life that is worthy of someone following you? Later on, after Jesus' life, Paul picks up the same uh, reference, kind of, in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. As he is discipling people, he's saying, hey, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to make Jesus the forgiver of my sins and the leader of my life, and come and follow me. So you get this picture of Jesus leading the way as Jesus being the leader, Paul following as closely as he can towards Jesus, and and Paul inviting others into that, that life and saying, come and be with me. As I follow Jesus, you follow me. And then you might be thinking to yourself, well, Cam, of course, Jesus said that, and of course, Paul said that. Paul wrote a third of the New Testament, and we put him up on this pedestal that he's full of righteousness. Well, if you remember, Paul's past, murderer, persecuting Christians, and even as Paul, the Paul that we know, even as he is writing, he is saying, I'm, I'm not that good. I'm a chief sinner, he, he would refer to himself as. In Philippians chapter 3, one of my favorite passages, starting in verse 7, it says this. This is Paul talking. He says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, a righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, the power of his resurrection, and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, of course Paul would be able to say that, that everything is garbage compared to knowing Jesus. So right after he says all of that, he says these important words, that I think are applicable to us today. He says this in verse 12, Not that I have already obtained all of this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I forget what is behind, and I strain towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So Paul's kind of talking out of two sides of his mouth here. He's saying, here's my life. Everything is garbage. I want to, I want to know Christ. I want to be about righteousness. I want to be, essentially, I want to be perfect. And then right after that, he says, but I, oh, I'm not there. I'm not there. I forget all of that stuff. That's the repentance that we talked about in the beginning of the book of Matthew, when Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. I forget what is behind and I strain towards what is ahead. That is grace. The ability to forget what is behind is because God has lavished his grace upon Paul and upon you and upon me. And so he is forgetting what is behind, forgetting all of the screw-ups, all of the mess-ups that he has done, and straining towards Jesus and the kingdom of God. And that is the picture of discipleship. That as you are following Jesus, grace is extended to you. You will screw up. You probably have screwed up today or maybe on the way here or even now as your mind is starting to wander. You have screwed up and grace is extended to you. 
And then as you start to call other people into your life, when people get close to you, they will see your flaws. You will see their flaws. It does not have to be perfect. Grace is extended to you. The disciples, we go back to, to, they had the perfect discipler, the only perfect discipler to ever live. When did they get it? We talk about that in, in Christian circles. Man, I just want this guy or this girl to get it. What it. First off, what does that even mean? And secondly, when would the disciples get it? When did they get that aha moment where, where they stopped messing up, they stopped saying the wrong thing, and they just started living a perfect life? I'll give you a second to, to thumb through your Bible and try to figure it out. The answer is they didn't. There was never a, a scenario where they were perfect, where they lived perfectly. You know, Peter is the one that gets thrown under the bus all the time, but, but he has all these mountaintop moments, literal mountaintop moments, and walking on water and seeing the fe- feeding of the 5,000 and being on a mountaintop where he saw God and, and all of these incredible things that Jesus did, and then yet he says all of these stupid things, and he denies that he even knows Jesus. And even, even after Jesus rose from the dead, he gets called out for some things that he's teaching. There is no... I. You, the, the time that the disciples got it, that it is all about grace. And they, just like Paul says, forgetting what is behind, they're straining towards what is ahead, which is the love and mercy of Jesus and calling other people to that. 2 Corinthians 12 says this, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. Think about that verse in the context of discipleship, that his grace is sufficient for us and that his power is made perfect in weakness. If we think we have figured it out or think we figured out the perfect formula for discipleship or our perfect formula for following Jesus, there is no room for the power to be made perfect through weakness. But as we understand that it's not about us, and that we are not good, that His grace is sufficient for us, and the power of God is made perfect through that weakness. That's the actual discipleship that can change lives. When when Christ's grace and His power is on display, not our own doing or our own wisdom. Okay, so that is discipleship in the context of bringing people along. So then, let's get into some applications. How do we actually do this? And I know what you're thinking, because I have often thought the same thing. How on earth can I invite other people into my life? I don't know enough. I don't have any time. I've got little kids running around. How on earth have I figured out? Sometimes I feel like I don't even have my faith figured out. How could I bring someone along with me? And here is what, what would be my encouragement. Just start. Initiate. Invite. That's one of the uh, tenets of our Pi Square card. Invite people in. There are things that we all have to do all the time. We eat meals. You can invite other people to those meals. We have to run errands. You can invite other people to those errands. This does not need to be another meeting, another calendar thing for you to do. But as you are living life in and around the people that God has called you to be around, you can invite them more into your life. That's discipleship. Again, friendship with a vision. I hope that all of us have friends. And if we have a vision for their life, then it can become a discipleship relationship. So just start, initiate, and don't take anything personally. There is grace is sufficient for you as you try to mess up and try to do this right and then mess up again. And there's grace for the person who feels uncomfortable and doesn't necessarily know what they're doing either. There's grace for both of you. But just start, initiate. I referenced it earlier, but the the three um, kind of tenets of our our Pi Square card are prayer, invest, and invite. Pray, invest, invite. And I would guess some of us in in, in our church are really good at the first one. We pr- we have some people that are way holier than me and prayer warriors. And I, I would I would bet that the second two come a little bit harder for those people. And then there's some people who are like, yeah, I'm all about community. I'm all about investing, inviting, but we lack the prayer. They ha- all three have to be there. If we just pray, we're just going to lock ourselves in our room and pray for people. And who knows what God's going to do because we would never actually find out because we're not investing and inviting those people into our lives. And then if we're just investing and inviting without the Holy Spirit, then we're just becoming another social club. And that's not what we want to be doing. 
We have to have all three. That we go back to what I said earlier. You are, you are never good. And that, that we have to include a third person into every discipleship relationship. And that person is the Holy Spirit, is Jesus, is the Word of God. Is spending time with something that doesn't change. We will fall flat on our face and screw up. The people we are reaching out to will fall flat on their face and screw up. Jesus has never done that. He is unchangeable. He's the beginning and the end. And he has to be a part of that. You have nothing to give. You only have something to show. There's power in that. Again, our, the power is made perfect in our weakness. That we, we can't give them anything of ourselves. We can only show them how good God is and how good a life with Jesus is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, one of my favorite verses, says this, So we cared for you because we loved you so much. We delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well. That's it. That's prayer, investing, inviting. That we, that we cared so much for someone. I imagine if you cared for someone, you'd pray for them. And that we were delighted to share our very lives. That's investing. And the gospel, that's the invitation. Pray, invest, invite. That we would share not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well. And I'll close with this last uh, passage of Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It's this idea of as we are growing in Christ, what that looks like. And it says this, this is Paul again. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I love this picture of what it means to grow in Christ. That we are all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. We are looking at the glory of God and how incredible He is. And we are being transformed, not 180 degrees, not just one day, oh, we get it all, we're good, we're done with discipleship, we're done with that following Jesus or reading our Bible, we read the whole thing, we're good. No, one degree to another, that there's these small incremental changes towards the glory of the Lord and towards righteousness. And conversely, if you are, are drawing people into yourself and saying, hey, come and follow me, and you are not being transformed more like the glory of God, you are transforming yourself and others one degree away from the glory of God. And one degree may not sound a lot. It is not a lot if you got your protractor out. It's not that, that far. But if we were to draw a line that is one degree apart, they would start out very close. And even in this parking lot uh, or in this room, they would uh, be pretty close. And then you know, a mile down the road, you wouldn't even be able to see the end of the lines because of the difference. That's, that's life. That is change. That is transformation that Jesus brings as sanctification. And so as, as we are discipling, as we are discipling people and as we are being discipled by Jesus, that's the change that's actually happening, that the Holy Spirit is doing. Where it may not feel day to day like we're, we're growing in likeness and towards the glory of God, but hopefully as we look back, six months, a year, two years, that we would actually see some life change. And man, I can't believe how far God has brought me and see the grace upon grace that has been lavished upon you and upon the people that you are discipling. And so uh, just a couple of questions and, and, and tangible things to take home for you as we close. Uh, the first one is, I mentioned it earlier, but are you living the life that you are calling others to? Are you living the life that you are calling others to? Are you living a life that you are praying for other people. You know, if you were one of those people who are, who are a prayer warrior and saying, God, I just pray that they would experience your blessings and your joy and your peace and all of the fruits of the Spirit. Are you living that life? I hope that you are. So that as we draw people in and invite them into our lives, that's what they're experiencing. Are you living the life that you're calling others to? And the second one is, what does your, your pi squared car look like? What, I hope that you have one. I hope that you know some people that you are praying for, that you are investing for and inviting for. And I would just say, again, just start. Figure out a way to invite a new person into your life. That um, uh, one of my favorite pastors, Matt Chandler, says, our, uh, our dining room tables have gotten too small and our privacy pen fences have gotten too tall. And that hopefully we would be able to invite some more people into our life. That we would kind of reverse that. That we'd say, come on in. Come on in. As I follow Jesus, come on in. 
that Jesus never sat down with the disciples as soon as he said, come and follow me. He never said, hey, I need you to do these 10 things correctly. I need you to be able to, to memorize these verses. And I need you to be able to explain these deep theological issues. All he said was, come and follow me. And they lived for three years and then they changed the face of the world. That's all we're saying. Follow me as I follow Jesus. So are you living the life that you're calling for? Are you living the life that you're calling others to? And what is your Pi Squared card look like. If you don't have one, um, you can email us, we'll get you one, or you can just jot it down on a piece of paper. Or if you come uh, to church, we have some there too. We'd love to see you face to face, not just uh, through the YouTube. Um, so let me, let me pray as we close. Jesus, thank you so much uh, for how much um, that you love us for your example of discipleship. God, thank you uh, that you call us to the life that we were created for, that it is the, the best way to live, that you invite us into a life to the fullest. I pray that we at this church and whoever's listening to this would experience that and not only just experience it for themselves, but call other people to it. And so I pray that you would lay some, some names and some faces on our hearts and that we would begin to pray and invest and invite. And uh, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in the midst of that and that we would see, see fruit and see encouragement in that process. We love you and just, just ask a blessing over all of the people listening to this. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Cam, for that awesome word. And I love the illustration that he used of one degree. I love the one degree who, although when it's close to the center, it doesn't seem like that much, but if you follow directions one degree off, you will never find what you're looking for. And so I hope that we take that again this evening or whatever time of day you're watching this, that you take that and we start to apply it to our life. What is the one degree of change? Because we're either changing one degree one way or the other. There is no sitting still. There is no sitting on the fence. There is no middle ground as we go about our daily lives. As we follow Jesus, we are either following him or we are falling behind. There is no neutral. So how are we moving that one step closer in our relationship with God? How are we moving that one step forward? How are we bringing other people along with us? How are we showing the people in our neighborhoods and our jobs and the different areas what it is to know Christ? How do we live it out with thankfulness? How do we live out the thankfulness that, of the grace that we experience daily? When something is so important to you, we can't help but talk about it. The things that are important to us, we tell everybody. How can we not tell other people about the grace that we are receiving and inviting them into that same grace. I hope that this finds you doing well. I hope that we are slowly applying those things. Hopefully this last week after hearing uh, Mike Siever talk, we are finding those times every day to spend time in God's word. And now we understand the importance of what it is to be grace filled, both showing grace in the people that we are discipling, but also allowing them and teaching them to show grace to us because we are humans. We are not Jesus and we will need grace from other people as we continue to move forward. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, please let us know if there is anything we can do to be praying for you. If there is anything that we can do to help you, uh, we want to be there for you. And if you're watching this locally, this Friday, June 25th, we are doing another grocery giveaway. However, we normally do one truck. This Friday, we will have three trucks coming. So if you would like to help, uh, if you would like to come and help serve with us, please go to hopechurchsc.com backslash serve and you can sign up to come help us. We would love to see you. I think we have four or five different churches that come together to help us do this for our community. If you can't join us, if you are not local for whatever reason, please be praying for us. Uh, please be praying that as it's not just groceries going out, but as people stop and are prayed for, that the gospel, that the Holy Spirit would be at work in these people's hearts and lives as well as ours. We love you so much. Thank you for praying for us, and we are praying for you. We love you, and we miss you, and we hope to see you soon.